Acts chapter 8. This was a fun message. Um, just in thinking about these things throughout the week and uh, <clears throat> meditating upon the talking today about the comforts in Christ's care. The comforts in Christ's care. Now, <clears throat> if you're involved in alternative news and, and, and hearing what, what you know, is being said between the lines whenever you watch the mainstream news, you'll know that we're, we're, well, I guess it doesn't even take following the news to know that things are dire, things are desperate. Um, we may have right now an inflated idea of security, peace and safety, the world would call it, but I believe that that inflated bubble is about to pop. All of the experts are saying that, that there's a financial crash imminent. All of the experts are saying that there's a, uh, there's, you know, a, a, a trucking um, a supply chain crash that's imminent. All of them are saying that the basic things that we need and, and, and want are going to break down. The grid is going down, essentially. When the grid goes down, so we need to rely on the fact that God goes up, especially in our focus, in our minds. With the lockdowns imminent, with the persecution on the horizon, we need to remember that we will suffer no lack. In fact, I believe that Christians will have more than those around them as times get desperate. Some of the things that we take for granted in our day and age, communication, travel, right? The keys for the vehicle that I came here today. The house that's in our possession, perhaps. The roof over our head. Food in the fridge. Some of these things that we take for granted, the world is going to see a lack of, I believe. I believe this is, there is coming a day when there will be struggles to keep the things that have become comforts to us. But we will always have those comforts in Christ's care. First one I want to look at is travel. Travel. All the borders are shut down, right? <clears throat> the idea is that, and I've heard it from airlines, you will not be able to travel internationally or domestic or otherwise without a vaccination. Currently, the travel restrictions are such that you gotta you got to put a cloth on your face to go. I think eventually it's going to escalate to, to different things and restrictions when it comes to travel. Look with me in Acts chapter 8. What we have, to re we have to rely on and trust in and look forward to, really, when travel restrictions are in full force. Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 3, the Bible says, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Okay, so here we have a time when Saul, as the religious leader of the opposition to God, most hated group, those Pharisees, is going about and hailing or hauling men and women out of their houses and committing them to prison. Why? For confessing the name of Christ. But the Bible says in verse 4, Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. There's your marching orders for when the laws change and suddenly it's illegal for you to believe like you believe, to follow Christ and trust Christ as you do. Go about in your scattered state abroad everywhere preaching the word. Verse 4 says that. Verse 5, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto him. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying out with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. So here we see this apostle Philip goes out from Samaria or from where he was to Samaria, and preaches the word unto the people that are there. God gives him special power.
to do miracles before them, unclean spirits crying out, departing out those that were possessed of them. Great joy comes abroad on this whole city. And it comes at a time when Christianity was illegal. And the Jewish authorities there were seeking to destroy those that confessed Christ. They were scattered about and they went about preaching. Verse 25 though, while they are scattered about, says this, And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. So even though I see that the church is scattered, they're still referred to in verse 25 as a they. What does that tell me? There will still be congregating. There will still be assembly. Even when, as I said, when, Canada makes it illegal to be a Christian. We will still have assembly. We will still gather. We will still be referred to as a they, even though we are scattered abroad. You can hope in that and see that the ministry goes forward. The word of the Lord is preached. Great miracles are done in his name. There's a great joy from city to city to city. I see it being more receptive when Christianity becomes illegal. Let's hope and pray in that direction. Continuing on in verse 26, it says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem into Galilee. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. So Philip here goes southward in that way as he's charged of the angel. I believe he was likely walking. So when transportation gets limited, we may have to do some more walking. Verse 28, it continues and says, Was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou read? So, the Phil, or Philip here is sent of the angel of God, walks down to the place where he sees the chariot, and then is charged to run and catch up with this chariot in order that he would hear the Ethiopian eunuch reading the, the Bible, but not understanding it. And so he asks him, do you understand what you're reading? Travel's limited. Well, there's always walking. There's always running. Verse 31, and he said, How can I except a man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture which he read was this. And that's interesting too. He walked, he ran, and now he's riding in a chariot. He just got a car ride. He was offered a ride by a friendly stranger as he seeks to preach the gospel unto him. Transportation in the last days perhaps. And he said, how can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. And his humiliation was judgment taken away, and who shall declare his generation? Verse 35 says, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached to him Jesus. What a wonderful spot for him to just happen to be reading. <laughs> I mean, that's the greatest segue you could imagine, Christ going as a sheep to the slaughter. So he simply opens his mouth and uses that same scripture to preach Christ unto this eunuch. I could spend all day there talking about that, but my focus is travel and transportation. Look at verse 37. It says, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, based on the preaching that he had heard there. We continue on, and we can read in verse 39. It says, And when they were come up out of the water, the eunuch, of course, being baptized, the Spirit of the Lord, watch this, caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. And Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Now, I don't know where Azotus is, haven't spotted it on a map, but whatever, wherever that is, Philip went from walking to running to getting a free ride to baptizing a fresh convert in the Spirit of God took him away to fly into another place to continue in his ministry. 
In the last days, could it be that some of the great exploits that we will do is we will get flight tickets that have nothing to do with Air Canada or Spirit or what have you, but God would just pick us up and take us where he wants us to preach? I believe so. You know what? I'm starting to pray already thinking about a scripture like this about the next time that I'll get to visit Guyana. That was closed off to us at the beginning of, at the beginning of COVID, at the beginning of the shutdown. You know, maybe it would be the Lord's will that he'd pick me up, drop me right there in one of those villages, and I'd get to preach the gospel for a whole day to all those people again in that nice, warm climate. That'd be a wonderful blessing, wouldn't it? It's not beyond God. He did it before. So they can restrict travel all they want. Was Philip here restricted in his ability to get around and serve God? The next one, this is going to be tough for us, communication. Communication. Verse 26 of that same chapter already highlights the fact. It says, the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip. Look at verse 29. It says, then the spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to the chariot. So first and foremost, we need to be communicating with the spirit in the last days. Of course, these cell phones allow us to reach our friends and our family and loved ones beyond and, and allow us to assemble as a church and talk in a common chat group, right? That's great. But in the last days, I believe this, this might be cut off. Grid down. Cell phones don't work. Towers are busted. Can you imagine such a scenario? Imagine the havoc that would be caused by something like that taking place. Well, the good news is you'll always be able to communicate with the Spirit. They can't, they can't take my tower down that connects me to the voice of God. I'll always be able to communicate with him. Go with me to Acts chapter 16, though. Could it be that we'd also still be able to communicate one with another without the luxury of modern wireless technology? Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 6, it says, Now... When they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after that they were come unto Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they passing by Mysia came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. So many, many, many miles away, the Apostle Paul is down here, and it seems he's having a little bit of a hindrance from the Spirit. He's suffered not to go into Bithynia. He's, he's forbidden to go into Asia, and he's probably wondering, what in the world can I do? I'm forbidden from traveling to these places, and the Apostle Paul's heart was to go and to minister to them into the gospel. Where should I go? What should I do? The Spirit then speaks doesn't isn't the one that speaks to him but in a vision it says a man a particular man of macedonia which was far far north from where he was at the time speaks to him it says come over into macedonia and help us so i'm starting to think about certain things that that i have come to rely on that i come to count on and my cell phone is one of them communication with the outside world via wireless um, wireless technology. What happens if that's gone? What happens if that is no more? What happens if it's disconnected? Well, could it be that God would use something like a vision to open up the line of communication between an apostle and a man of Macedonia to implement a call to come and help? I mean, it, either we believe the word of God or we don't. This actually happened in the Apostle Paul's day. He was called by a man of Macedonia. Did he have a cell phone? No. Did he go on the, you know, the, the FaceTime and that's, that was the vision that he saw was this man of Macedonia? No. The good news about this type of communication is you're not going to have salesmen calling. There's not going to be any crank calls or anything like that but a direct line provided by God to communicate with people far beyond in order what? That help could come. Look, so far both cases have been God using, you know, his technology, if you want to bring it down to that base level. His, his methods of communication and travel to get his work done. 
So what do we got to do? We got to be laboring in the things of God. Those that know God are seeking God will be able to do, I believe, these great things. Verse 10, it says, and after that, he had seen the vision. Immediately, we endeavored to go into Macedonia, surely gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course unto Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi, which was the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony, and we were in that city abiding certain days. So several cities were passed by, one, two, three different cities, and it's not like it is today. Imagine if I was to just go three cities over now by foot, or whatever way they were traveling, I believe, it would take a while to get there. You don't just to get to my city, which is two or three over, I have to get into a car and go for an hour to get down to Kitchener-Waterloo. They would have taken much time to get there, and nevertheless, God was able to span that area of communication in order to get his work done. In verse 14, it says, A certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us. The Bible says that when she heard the gospel, she loved what she heard so much, she was saved, baptized, and invited everybody by constraint to abide there with her. So not only has God so far provided opportunity to travel to get his work done, he's given communication in order for um, the call to come out and people to go and to follow after a need. And here we find also that the first receptive person that receives of the good news that Paul has invites him and constrains him to stay with her, giving a proper house for him to abide in. He met Lydia and she was saved. Verse 16, it talks about this demon-possessed woman that was bringing her master's much gain by seussing, being born again as a result of the Apostle Paul showing up after he received that call from God to go and to perform that work. She is saved, and of course, she was happy that he had received that call and came there. As a result of that, many were angered because this woman was used in her divination and in her demon-possessed position to bring much gain unto different people. And so... Many were angered as a result of the Apostle Paul going there. It says in verse 22, And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. When they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. It doesn't sound very safe to me to be thrust into the furthest prison fastened to stocks, metal and wood, holding them in place, and then kept by guard for such a time. Nevertheless, God was in this as well. Look, the call was received for Paul to go there. Lydia was saved. A damsel was saved. And now he's standing before a jailer, and he asks him that very simple question. What must I do to be saved? Why did the jailer ask that? Because he heard the praises of Paul and Cyrus unto God as they were locked up, as they were, as they were in, in the lowest of state, in the deepest prison. No hope. And they, were, they were beaten. They were in a sorry state. And these guys are rejoicing that God had allowed for them to suffer for his sake. That's something we should keep in mind too. When God leads us into certain situations, it may be rough for us, but we've got to rejoice in the fact that God is trusting us to go through that particular situation. So they sang. They prayed unto God. And as a result of that testimony, and what? Prison doors falling down as a result of a miracle of God. He asked them, what must I do to be saved? And the simple answer is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He's born again. He brings them out, washes their stripes. He's baptized. He brings them to his own house, rejoicing, believing in God and all of his house. They're baptized as well. And this great and wonderful miracle plays out as a result of one, I want to call it a cell phone call, but there's certainly a call that came from afar and they did it without modern towers, modern technologies. Look, there was communication available between cities between many cities as a result of the miracle of God. But I think one thing that we all lose track of when it comes to these phones is one thing that we're missing is face-to-face -face communication. And glory to God, I think we'll get back to that. 
these things go down, if they stop working, if they lock them out, you know, maybe that's the next thing. Oh, you got to get your, you got to wear a mask to use a cell phone. I don't know. They're doing all these crazy mandates that make no sense. Who knows how far it could go, right? So when the limitation comes, what could God do but great miracles? Calls still go through. We get back to face-to-face, -face, personal conflict conversation people get saved as a result of that personal connection next thing we saw it right there was a jailbreak what happens when christianity becomes banned when it becomes outlawed when it's no longer deemed acceptable maybe they call it a uh, a, a mental disease all these believe believers in in a god right maybe maybe they call that a mental illness and as a result you're thrown in jail for your beliefs well, he says here, certain relief was promised and, and provided for his believers. He also promises to give them boldness at such a time. Verse 37, it says, But Paul said unto them, They have beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans, and have cast us into prison, and now do they thrust us out privily? Nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. So it was revealed that what they had done to Paul was against Roman law. He called into question that very law. They realized they were wrong. They tried to send him away privily. And the apostle Paul, in boldness, says, no, make them come down here and admit that they did wrong, that they did me wrong. And you know what? By and large, in Canada, we have that same type of... of uh, of right at our disposal. The things that are happening unto us are illegal according to the books. But it is what it is when it comes to that. The one thing I noticed here was that Paul wasn't telling them that he was a Roman citizen and therefore they should uphold his rights as a Roman citizen. No, he was saying, don't you know your laws? And he was making them appeal to their own laws. And in doing so, he was released. Paul is a citizen of heaven. I'm a citizen of heaven. We're all citizens of New Jerusalem, the Israel of God. And that is where we live and where we abide and where we have our being. We need not forget that. But he had boldness and he was released from prison as a result of using his words in boldness. The next is Acts chapter 12. We find another case, a much more miraculous case. Hey, you get locked up for being a Christian, they can put you in the innermost sanctum, lock you up, bar you up, and then throw away the key and put guards everywhere. Look what happens in verse 1 of Acts chapter 12. Now about the time of Herod, the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John with the sword. And because he saw it please the Jew, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Now, of course, James was killed here. And of course... Not everybody is going to escape everything that is thrown at us when it comes to persecution. But hey, for James, he's not complaining. Absent from the body is present with the Lord. Isn't that a wonderful blessing and miracle that comes as a result of troubles and strife that enters into our lives? But he locks up Peter, and verse 4 says, And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quatrains of soldiers to keep him. So I believe a quatrainian would be four, so four times four, 16 soldiers keeping this one man. It says, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains. The keepers before the door kept the prison. That seems pretty hopeless, doesn't it? You're sleeping on the ground. You're chained up. There's two uh, keepers beside you, soldiers watching over you. And then outside and before that door, there's more soldiers keeping that door. But watch verse 7. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him. And a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side. No. Raised him up quickly, saying, Arise quickly, get up. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel. But he thought he saw a vision. When they were past thy first and second ward, they came into the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed 
from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hands of Herod and from the expectation of the people of the Jews. Locked in prison for your faith and for your preaching and for your stand. It just may be that God would open those prison doors of their own accord, loose you from all the chains, blind the minds and eyes of all those that are keeping you there, and you may walk free. I think sometimes Christians tend to get bogged down with all of the conspiracy and certainly the world is full of conspiracy against us and certainly there is all sorts of wicked plots against us the principalities and powers and rulers of darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places is always bent towards pressing down christians destroying christians removing our freedoms removing our liberties taking away our faith and turning it to fear we need not fear. You see stories like this, and we sometimes dismiss them and say, oh, that's just the apostles. That's just for the characters of the Bible. No, no, no. The last days, there will be great exploits done. And it could be that you're accounted worthy for your faith to travel to a far and distant land to preach, to preach the gospel. It could be that you're accounted worthy for your faith to hear a call from afar and to go and to see many saved. It could be that for your faith you were called to go into prison, get somebody saved in there and then be released, or as Peter did, simply walk free. Next is, uh-oh, social media. Social media. Can people live without social media? One of these conveniences, these comforts that we have, Acts chapter 10 and verse 19. How are we going to connect? How are we going to find like-minded people if we can't get to them on Facebook per our interests and the algorithm that puts it all together? How will we ever connect one to another without social media? Look at Acts chapter 10 and verse 19. The Bible has a solution. God always has, a, has an alternative. Really what we're witnessing with the travel, the communication, the job, all those things can be good things. But sometimes it's just the devil trying to mimic what God has already done. Look, at our, our cell phones allow us to see a screen and see someone at the other side of the world. God already did it. <laughs> 2,000 years ago, FaceTime was no thing for him. All right? <laughs> it's interesting. It's amazing to see. Social media then, Acts chapter 10, in verse 19, it says, While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Rise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Look at God connected these three men that are seeking the Apostle Peter, seeking the gospel, seeking the truth from him, and God tells Peter, go with them and connects them in that way. Verse 21, it says, Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man and one that feareth God and of good report among all the nations of the Jews was warned of God by an holy angel to send for thee into the house and to hear words of thee. Look, he's trying to get a hold of a preacher. He's trying to get a hold of somebody that can tell him more about the things of God. Verse 23, Then called he them in and lodged them. And on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. Look, he gathered all his friends together. They're all assembled in that same place to connect with God's man at this time. He sent those out God showed Peter that they would come. When Peter arrived, Cornelius already had all his friends gathered together. And in verse 25, it says, As Peter was coming down in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. And Peter took him up, saying, I myself also am a man. He said, Stand up. I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. So there's a great connection of people that are like-minded, come together and meeting. And this is wonderful. This is so much better than social media. They're in one place. They're actually face-to-face. -face. They're actually connected, not just friends via uh, a, a, a fake connection on a, on a digital feed. 
They're actually gathered together in one place, come together like-minded people for a common reason. Verse 28, it says, And they said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company, or to come one nation unto another. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore I came unto you without gainsaying, as soon as I was sent for. I ask therefore, for what intent ye have sent for me? And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour I prayed in mine house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, saying, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore, I sent unto thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee. Social media, no need if we can gather together socially again. But look, God actually ordained that it would even be these like-minded people. Look, we always think about our social media network of friends are generally people that have a common connection, right? Right? They're your co-workers. They're your church friends. They're, they're people that you knew from the past. They're family members. There's the common bond that unites everybody. But here, God uses his version of social media to gather and connect all of these like-minded people. And this is probably, I believe, what's going to happen in the last days when it comes to just assembling as a church. We saw that the church was scattered abroad in that first chapter, chapter 8 that I brought up. The church was scattered abroad. Nevertheless, didn't they assemble together? There was a group of them that were together. How? God orchestrating steps. God sending messages to this man to send people to that man to show him to go to a common place. And he connected them and allowed for them to come together. What happens when they came together? A wonderful church service. He led them all to the Lord. He baptized them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost with that wonderful saying there. This is one of the greatest revelations of the book of Acts, of the Bible itself in verse 43. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive the remission of sins. I love that verse because that gives affirmation to the entirety of the Old Testament scriptures. They're all pointing to Christ. And they're all saying whosoever believeth in him shall receive the remission of sins. And all of that happened because God connected them socially. Next is translation. This is an easy one, Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> what happens if I'm in some village or some place or some neighborhood and I'm trying to give the gospel to someone and they just don't understand me? Translation. If we don't have Google Translate, what in the world are we going to do? If we don't have a translator present, what can we do? If I don't have my app to show people a different version of the gospel in some other language, could it be that God would just simply allow for us to preach that language? Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all of one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterances. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And so these are real languages that the disciples have never studied, had no knowledge of previous, but God gave them power through the Holy Ghost and utterance to speak unto men in their own language. There's Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers of Mesopotamia, of Cappadocia, Asia, Phrygia, Egypt, Libya, and so on. Rome, Jews, proselytes, Greeks, and Arabians are all hearing the wonderful gifts of God because God gave the power of translation unto them. Now these are different conveniences that we have in our day that if they were removed from us, God has an alternative. Now I would say that God has the original. The alternative is what we have. My alternative for communicating is my cell phone. Because God had a better way before, didn't he? He connected people. My alternative for connecting with 
people is social media. But look, God's able to do that. My alternative for translation is to go to Google Translate. But if God wants his work and his word to go forward in another language through me, he is certainly able to do so. Without these modern conveniences of travel, communication, uh, freedom from, from jail and imprisonment, social media and translation, there, there needs not to be those conveniences for God has those comforts already prepared for us. I'm talking about comforts we have in Christ's care. And in the last days, we just need to be reminded, I believe, of some of these verses and some of these instances where God did these types of things for his people and just by faith say, you know what, God, you did it for them, you can do it for me. Just like the, uh, the Hebrew boys did when they were pressed with the fiery furnace and they said, look, we're going to heat this thing up seven times. I will give you one more chance. Bow down to the golden image. Worship the beast, right? Sir, you know, forsake your God. And you know what they said? You know what? Our God is able. And we can say the same thing. You know what? Our God is able. If he wants to, he can deliver me from jail. If he wants to, he can allow me to communicate to someone. For If he wants to, he can pick me up and move me to the other side of the world so I can preach the gospel. But if he doesn't want to, nevertheless, we will not serve your Lord. We will not follow after um, Satan. We will not bow down to this image. And in the last days, again, we need to decide where we want to stand. And look, by faith, we can just count on the fact that God has done great things through his people in the past. The next one that we'll find is shelter. Last days, things are desperate. What happens when you don't have a shelter? Well, we've already noticed it in a few cases here. But think of Lydia. She was saved and immediately welcomed in the disciples. Apostle Paul um, and, and his, his companion at that time, specifically so that they could rest and abide there, constrained them to stay. And there's many other cases where the Bible actually affirms that saying, the laborer is worthy of his hire. In other words, you will have what you need because you're a laborer. The Bible says in Acts chapter 20, you can go there, Acts chapter 20, and here's another example. Shelter in the last days, you know, like I said, when that bubble pops think about 2008 how many people lost their homes and that was a mini recession <clears throat> think about what happened a few months ago <clears throat> when things locked down the whole economy of the world grinding to a halt <clears throat> when that bubble burst there could be lots of people without a shelter Acts chapter 20, and verse 32. And look, this should be encouraging. It says, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you inheritance among all them which are sanctified. The Apostle Paul here says, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now look, the Apostle Paul here is indicating that as he went from church to church to church to church, his default was to minister unto his own necessities. You know what that means? He worked hard wherever he went. He toiled and labored in order that he could have what he needed of necessity, but also look what he says. He also labored that he could support the weak. He showed the example of how Christians ought to be hard workers that are able to support others who are weak, who are lacking, who have need. He says, I have showed you all that so laboring ye ought to support the weak. And he says it's more blessed to give than to receive. And I believe that the last day Christians will be given opportunity to use hospitality. To be given opportunity to work and to labor and to toil and to minister in the things of God. And as a result of all that God blesses you with, you can help and support the weak and those that have not. And this is going to be what we rely on in the last days. And you find scores of examples where believers welcome in a laborer who's worthy of his hire and support him and strengthen him and give him food and give him necessities. It's not just the shelter, as I alluded to. It's also food and water. 
The Bible says in Psalm 37, verse 25, I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. So look, when the grocery stores are empty, when the water is all poisoned, whatever, the worst case scenarios that could happen, and that's not even that far-fetched because there's types and places in the world right now where their water is poisoned, their food is scarce, they have nothing, they don't have any shelter. But if they can rely on God and they could rely on other believers to use hospitality one toward another, then you know what you see? You see there's no hope, there's no chance of God's people ever begging bread. Why? Because God's going to do what he did in the first half of this sermon. He's going to communicate to one to go over to here. He's going to connect them. He's going to bring them to places. The ministers are going to go about and do works worthy of the meat that is given them. And everybody that's working for Christ will certainly be provided for at that time. And those that are weak and cannot work for Christ, perhaps, they'll be given opportunities to minister unto others at, at, at that same time. Shelter. You're not going to be lacking. Food and water, you're not going to be lacking, but we need to be serving God and knowing Him in the last days. What about this? Money. You know, I think money's going to perish. It said in the book of uh, um, Exodus, money failed. There came a great famine, which I believe could come soon to Canada. And in the time of great famine, people started to essentially sell themselves when money fainted. Okay? So they all came to the, the, the government, which had all of the stores, which had all of the food and the sustenance, and money failed so that they began selling themselves. But if money is still a commodity going around, if, if we're still able to use it in order to buy and sell, and of course the Bible promises that that's going to be out the door soon. No more money, but a mark in your right hand or forehead as currency. You know what? Jesus has that wonderful saying where... He's, he, um, the wonderful opportunity that came up when the Apostle Peter was asked of somebody, and so he came to Jesus and said, Lord, should we pay taxes? And Jesus says, taxes aren't really fair, right? They should, they should be charging the foreigners, not their own people. But he said, nevertheless, lest we should offend, go fishing, and you'll find money in the fish's mouth. If we need money, okay, you can just, you know, God can do that. We don't have to say that, God, Lord, I need money. I need, I need this to do something. I need, I need finances. Hey, God can even have you pull money out of a fish's mouth. He's done it before. Don't doubt him. We can, by faith, just look at all of the examples of God providing for his people and realize that he's, he hasn't ceased from doing that. We don't see it all the time. You know what? Sometimes I think it happens, but we just, we're blinded to it the different ways that God provides for his own people. Wonderful miracles. Now watch this, safety from natural disaster. Okay, Acts chapter 27. The last days, Bible does promise natural disasters. And uh, <clears throat> I'm on one of these YouTube channels I, I follow sometimes. And uh, it shows basically what's going on in the world. And I don't know if you know, but as far as, as, far as hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes, 2020 has been record-breaking. Fires, okay? Australia had that fire at the beginning of 2020, and everyone thought that was bad. They are already exponentially going. I mean, it'll be a miracle if the entire island doesn't burn up at this point. Natural disasters are certainly coming. But Jesus said, peace be still. And the winds and waves obeyed him while he was on that ship with the disciples. There, Lord, help us. We perish on the Sea of Galilee as the waves are tossing to and fro and throwing them all over the place. And Jesus is under there napping. You think natural disasters are something that God has any concern over? He can literally just go, peace be still, and it stops. Acts chapter 27 and in verse 13, it says, And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Euryclidon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up to the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat. When they had taken up, they used helps, 
undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, strike sail and were so driven. And we being exceeding tossed with a tempest. And the next day they lightened the ship. And the third day was cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, no small tempest lay on us. All hope that we should be saved was taken away. There's some sailing terms there, but basically what happens was it was so bad, they locked in the, the, the ship and let her drive. Just let the waves take them wherever they could go. Then they saw the ship started failing, so they undergird it. They run big straps underneath it and basically tie it together so that instead of the ship busting open, it would at least hold it. Then the Bible says that they started to toss off all of their food supplies and all of their resources for the weight just so that the, bo the, the boat would stop taking on water, I believe. This thing was just holding on by a thread. They threw everything overboard. The Bible says they didn't see sun, moon, or stars. No way of navigating. No way of even knowing where they are. They lost all hope. They had given up. Literally. You know what? It's over. There is no hope. There is no help for us. <clears throat> Verse 21, it says, But after a long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete to have gained this harm and loss. I don't know if I could keep my tongue as long as Apostle Paul did, but he waited till there was certainty of no hope but Christ. Amen. He said, And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, fear, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Look at this. The angel of the Lord said, Look, Paul, I have plans for you. You must see Caesar. You must go for it. This is your destiny. This is where I want you to be. You will survive this. Fear not. And lo, I'm going to give you all these that sail with you. And he says, be, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Look, he trusted the Lord to pull him through what was coming. Even though that they were still in the turmoil, they were still in the tempest, they were still being tossed about. And look, the Apostle Paul wasn't, wasn't free from this. He, it's not like he wasn't flying all over the place. It's not like he wasn't getting wet. He wasn't getting cold. He wasn't throwing things overboard. But he had that long abstinence where he just held his tongue and he knew that whole time that God had him in his hand. And he knew that he was going to come forth on the other end. We need to have that same faith when it comes to the natural disasters that certainly will come upon this world. I don't know that we're going to sink off into the ocean like California has promised to do when that earthquake finally busts that thing open. I don't know if we're going to burn up like Australia is set to do when God just finally relinquishes all of the winds and brings the heat upon them in order to judge that wicked nation. I don't know how Canada is going to face certain natural disasters, but I do believe they will come. But in that, we can say, you know what? I believe God. That it shall be even as it was told unto me. You know what? If I perish, I perish. Because even in that we can believe God. That even as it was told you, it shall come to pass. And absent from the body, you will be present with the Lord. You have hope in that. That you have safety from natural disasters. Next, safety from beasts and from poison. Acts chapter 28 and verse 1 it says, And when they were escaped and they knew that the island was called Melita... And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us, every one, because of the present rain and because of the cold. And there's another example of hospitality. Coming from barbarians, they invited them in and kept them warm and fed them. It says in verse 3, And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, and they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, 
But after that they had looked a great while, they saw no harm come on him. They changed their minds and said that he was a god. They're obviously unbelievers and obviously, obviously not. They're superstitious at best. But nevertheless, they knew enough of that viper that this, the bite should have killed him. But it didn't. And you know what? If you go to Acts or Mark chapter 16, Mark chapter 16, that's just the fulfillment there of the promise that was made to all those that believe. Look, travel breaks down, communication lines are cut, we're thrown in jail, we don't have social media, we can't translate the word of God, we don't have shelter, food, water, there's no money left. So national, natural disasters are coming in and wreaking havoc on the world as God shows his mighty arm. Poisons and deadly beasts are all around. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, it says, Go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The marching orders do not change. Though the world around may be tossed and to and fro, being destroyed and judged by Almighty God. The command is still to go and to preach the gospel. It says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. Verse 17, it says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. We saw that in Acts 16. They shall speak with new tongues, Acts chapter 2. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. We just read about that in Acts chapter 28. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Healings from Acts chapter 3 and so on. God can still do these things. These aren't just reserved for the disciples of the book of Acts. These are shown to us as an example, I believe, on us whom the ends of the earth have come. God fulfilled it in them. He certainly will fulfill it in us if our focus is that great commission to go into all the world, to preach the gospel to every creature, and to stand on the word of God. Verse 19, and why would this be so? So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. It's because God's on the throne that we'll be safe and comforted in these last days. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following amen. Don't get bogged down with the gloom. Don't get bogged down with the doom. Don't look to the news to tell you how you ought to feel in these last days. Look to the scriptures and trust that God's still on the throne working with us showing signs in his disciples in order that other men would hear and believe and be saved, because that is still his heartbeat here in this world. John 14 and verse 12, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, and Christ did some great works, didn't he? The apostles did some great works, didn't they? He said, the works that I do, shall he do also, if you believe on him. And greater works than these shall ye do, because I go to my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, keep my commandments. That means maintain good works, follow after him. Believe the Bible. And do the Bible to the best of your ability. Verse 16, it says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. <laughs> but ye know him. For he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come unto you. These are the comforts of Christ's care. The world has its alternative comforts. Nothing's better than what God gives to his believers, to those that love him, keep his commandments, to those that believe on him and trust him by faith. 
And this is what we need to count on in the last days. I said, if you just listen to the world and even, even Christians now, they're talking about the, the, the world and how it's going to destroy us and the tribulation and the attacks that are coming and all these things and you can just get depressed and bogged down. I had to do this study because as I thought on it, I'm just like, man, God has all of these things taken care of. I need not worry about a single thing. I can't travel. I can't communicate. I can't, I'm stuck in jail. I don't have any shelter. I don't have any food. I don't have any money. There's a natural disaster coming in. I'm attacked by beasts and poisons. God's got all these things under control because he's on the throne. Believe that and trust that. To God be the glory.